and gentlemen, uh, I consider this as a great honor and a privilege uh, to be here on your plenary session and to share some of my experience on uh, a subject which I believe uh, strongly uh, related to, to your life also, uh, especially to this uh, young ladies and gentlemen who are on their own chats. I'd like to request you to pay attention because that can be one of your research projects and your studies. Uh, this is a photograph I took and my camera when I was uh, going back to Peradun University after taking a parliamentary meeting. Not, I'm not a parliamentary anyway, anyway. There's a parliamentary select committee to uh, decide or discuss about reasons for recent traffic accidents. So I was uh, uh, kind of advised to that and I was invited to make a presentation on my way back. My vehicle met with an accident. So my topic is the role of professionals in controlling road traffic accidents. When I got this invitation, I thought rather than making one, one specific research project I conducted, I decided to uh, share some of uh, the findings of few research projects I carried out during last uh, 20 years of my research experience. But specifically, uh, Dr. Lakmar's request was to eliminate all engineering related projects. That was one of his requests. So I, I removed most of the engineering related projects, but I did multidisciplinary projects on road traffic accidents. Traffic accidents are quite common and you see almost every day. Now, yesterday I contacted the traffic headquarters to get the latest information. It's alarming. And it's alarming. And it's high time for us to keep our eyes and ears open on this matter. All talk about dengue, but totally forgotten about traffic accidents. There are so many people coming behind us and checking our gutters, checking behind our favorite refrigerators, but there are so many drivers misbehave on the road, but nobody cares. And they are with nice slogans, nice uh, names indicating their professions, their organizations, but still nobody takes care. Even the police, if there's any police officer here, they keep their blind eye on that, but people come in behind us to check the mosquitoes on dengue, which do not take that many lives. So, these are some of my photographs I took, and I already conducted three photographic exhibitions. I may be the only one. Uh, conducted photographic exhibitions of traffic accidents in this country. I have huge collections of photographs and I do a lot of public awareness programs. More than research, I enjoy doing that. I don't know whether you have seen any of my newspaper articles and you have seen me in TV. I am a regular participant in many live TV programs on prevention of road traffic accidents. And I am a regular writer to newspapers, mainly in signal language, to educate drivers on their behavior. I, I, it's in a way good. Uh, we can we can have okay. We can have it without without slides sometimes. Until uh, that oh, that's a nice gadget. From where did you get that? That's <laughs> <laughs> technology. Technology. Do you use? Well, uh, it may come up in my slides also. Have you uh, heard? We lose. Nearly 3,400 valuable lives per day because of traffic accidents. I was not wrong. I said 3,400 lives per day globally. But in this country, we lose nearly 8, more than 8 actually, 8.2 lives per day because of traffic, or traffic accidents. Now whose responsibility is that? When you hear about a traffic accident, always you feel like saying, it's the driver's mistake. It's the driver's at fault. Is that true? Not always. We force them to misbehave. This is one such photograph taken from uh, Hubbard and uh, Trinkamali Road. We make roads. We have the best road network in this part of the world. We have 1.52 kilometers per square kilometers, which is very high density. We have good quality vehicles, but we don't have good quality people. We don't see the real professionalism on roads, especially when your vehicle is uh, flagged with your profession, you assume it is a license to misbehave. And you create a lot of health and accidents. If you go in the morning to a school premises, you feel like it's a government officer's conference. So many government vehicles and they misbehave well back compared to others. It's not three wheel drivers and bus drivers, four private bus drivers only responsible for traffic accidents. So what are the roles of the professionals for this? 
if you are a professional, if you want to maintain your professional ethics and dignity, you should show that on the roads also. So we as professionals can play a big role rather than blaming three-wheeler drivers and private private bus driver drivers for this. Among three wheelers, nearly 15% of them have never been to a school even on a rainy day for a shelter. And you expect them to behave well while you with basic degrees and masters and PhDs and with the high quality uh, salaries and recognition of the society grant permission from various places to misbehave. How serious it is, this is what I said. I said 1.3 million deaths per year is the cost for traffic accidents around the world. I'm not saying that this is WHO statistics. Plus 20 to 50 million injuries, which is which is much higher burden than the 1.3 million deaths. Deaths, but it is right or wrong, they can go on. But it's 20 to 50 million people should survive. The government should spend money for that. And this is what the WHO says. 1.3 billion. And uh, who are the main victims? Unfortunately, poor pedestrians, or we call it VRUs, vulnerable road users. Pedestrians, motorcyclists, and push cyclists. Which means our old parents and our young children either going to home, going to school, go to playground, and coming back. So when you use a vehicle, you have to be very careful. And who contributed to it? Is it developer or developing bill? According to the game statistics of WHO, I'm not here to present only WHO statistics, but I want to show how serious it is. WHO says, if you consider the population, high-income countries contribute only 15.6. And the road traffic deaths, only 8.5. Whereas, their vehicle, vehicle registration is 52.1. Uh, Where are we? Either middle-income or low-income, you got, would like to call Sri Lanka as a middle-income country, our population contribute 47.8 and our traffic, traffic deaths 41.6 but vehicle, vehicle percentage is 38.7. So the 92%, almost 92% of accidents report from countries like ours. So we have to consider 50% of victims are vulnerable road users. Do you see what it is? It's an pedestrian crossing. A bus has stopped for some reason, another bus is overtaking, while overtaking, a pregnant lady is trying to get rid of the bus. This is the situation of Sri Lanka. I said Sri Lanka. And WHO says, war contributes only 3.4% of unintentional deaths, but traffic accidents contribute 22.8. That means seven times. The war, your seniors handle serious only 3.7, 3.4, whereas road deaths, contribute 22.8, seven times. And further, WHO says, in 2004, road traffic accidents was in the ninth place for disabilities and deaths. But they predict in 2030, according to the rise we have now, to come to the place like five. What should we do? This was the chart I prepared just before coming. But yesterday, I called traffic headquarters and got the latest information. According to the, the yesterday's it, the day before yesterday in the day information. I knew it's about 3,003 3 deaths happened in 2016, but they updated me with new figures. 3,020 died in 2016 because of road traffic accidents. That is not a job. That's what I said. Nearly eight lives. 3,020. Sri Lanka, we lose one life, but every two, 2.9 hours, it's close to three hours, one death is reported. And further, yesterday traffic headquarters updated me with the latest figures. They said, up to 31st of May, comparing two years, 2016 and 2017, in 2017, we lost 49 more lives compared to 2016. So which means I expect at the end of 2017 to be the figure close to 4,000, not, not 3,020. Don't forget, within that 4,000, even one of us may be there. Who knows? So we have to work seriously and see what we can contribute, how we can contribute. In 110, I have two question marks. Accidents of various categories reported to police stations. I'll elaborate what these question marks are. When you look for accidents, reasons for accidents, finally 95% of accidents happen 
because of human error. So this is where the multidisciplinary approach is required. That is why probably Dr. Lakma asked me to remove all the injury-related projects and show the other projects related to human behavior and driver behavior and various P's responsible for that. I'll show you what those P's are. And this is a mis mistype actually. It's according to the information I gathered from police again. One of the major reasons for road traffic accidents in these countries is careless overtaking. So be careful when you overtake next time. The number two is high speed. I mean, for both cases, high speed trip matters a lot. Who overtake and who died? And when you ask for reasons for traffic accidents, like uh, trying to explain the shape of an elephant by five blind people or visually handicapped people, does it say what is somebody in this country? You blame only one party, but which is not fair. This is the research output of multifactorialness, multifactorialism of the road traffic accidents, the behavior of road traffic accidents. It says anyway, human factors contribute on 95%, but they are multifactorial. It is human, it is road environment, it is vehicle, and few others. So you and me has a role to play. When you get into the bus, when you get off from the bus, when you walk across the road, when you use a mobile phone while driving or while walking, that is one of the main reasons for road traffic accidents all over the world today. Use of destructive units like mobile phones. It's you. When I did one study in Candy, Kurunagel and Gold, I found all the youngsters are very, very common with misbehavior on roads. They use mobile phones for some reason. It's over 16 percent. What are our challenges? Are? These are some of our challenges in road safety, road safety related studies. These accident reports were received from uh, traffic headquarters. I plotted accident reports from 1977 up to 2010 and beyond. And I found a sudden drop of road traffic accidents after 2003. I had the opportunity of making this presentation in the parliament. When I showed this presentation in the parliament, one of the senior ministers said on the front seat said, it's because of our government. Yeah. We brought all the new regulations, rules and regulations so drivers behave well, so accidents went down. I said, no, no, minister. That's not the fact I know. The fact I know is, in 2003, this country introduced for the first time in the whole world an illegal thing. What was that? You make an accident and take a photograph and disappear. We will pay, pay the whole sum of money and the same car to you, called on the spot killing system. And from that point onwards, drivers had the freedom of moving away from the accident scene, only taking a photograph, which is illegal according to the Sri Lankan law. If you make an accident, you have to report to the police. But they are ready to pay the compensation without a police report. So why should you go and bother and waste our time in police stations? So accidents went down. And what is the end result? We calculate something called, if there's anybody who work on traffic accidents, we calculate a factor called severity index. We calculate the severity index based on total number of accidents divided by the fatalities. Now, the total number of accidents went down, but the fatalities remain the same. So what happened? Fatality index went up. And that gives a black mark to this beautiful island. Your fatality rate is higher compared to many other countries. It's not really fatality rates went down, but it's the actual accident reporting. Anyway, under-reporting is a common factor anywhere in the world. I just downloaded a paper from Accident Crisis and Prevention. It elaborates nicely how accidents are underreported, especially when it is a property damage. Where it damage only properties. Property damage, minor injuries, major injuries, and fatalities. When it's fatalities, traffic accident reporting rate is very high, over 98%. But when it's a property damage, it's up to 40% to 42%. And on top of that, when this, some of these insurance companies promote it, and it further goes down. So our fatality rate goes up. So that gives a black mark, even whether we are a low-income country or a middle-income country. That's a bad indication. This is how I projected using regression. So if you remember the figures I displayed a little while ago, it said we had 39,000 accidents happen. But if you look at this graph, it should be over 80,000 accidents happen with the same trend of underreporting. So that is why I had two question marks. So this is one trait we have. When we are doing a study these days to collect proper accident records. Accident records are commonly available, whatever the country you do the study, in police stations. Police is, is 
legally authorized to collect information. But in addition to that, you can collect little more reliable information from two more sources. One is hospitals, the other one is insurance. Insurance, even if they don't ask for a police report, they make a report. Without that, they don't pay the compensation. So we're trying to reach those two organizations to find the underreporting rate and the severity of underreporting in this country to bring back that, uh, remove that black mark from this country. Why so many accidents? We say with the industrialization, accidents increased, so they used a technique called with the permission of Dr. Lakma, they asked me to remove the word engineering out, but I am compelled to use it. They use a four E concept called engineering, education, enforcement, and emergency care. You have to have proper engineered road. But even if you have proper engineered road, if you don't have proper education, how to use those roads? And what are the dangers? And what is the minimum speed? The safe speed to drive? People will fly. That's what, happened. That's what is happening today. When they see a carpeted road, they forget everything. The problems at home, problems of the vehicle and the capacity of the vehicle. They start and rather than driving, they start flying. And they fly to the next bird. That is the danger. And they take some of their friends also to the next bird. So we need enforcement. Try to cross borders without looking at the number plate, without looking at the the, clock, the, the tag in the vehicle, without looking at the, the position displayed in the in, in the dashboard. If there are police officers, they know how they are reasonable in taking actions for some vehicles when you have special number plates and when you have uh, your profession display. We are struggling with police to be fair with everybody. It's not happening. You will sound very sad. And who is responsible for this? Now Dr. Lakmar will be happy. These are the P words. Policy is responsible. Professionals. This is a key word. Key word you wanted me to have. And policy makers, politicians, pedestrians, parents. You can name large number of places with P to work against traffic accidents. You and me. You as a pedestrian. You very soon as a parent. And you are a public officer. And you as a professional. You have multifactorial responsibility. And don't direct your finger only to drivers. Drivers are forced to misbehave. They are forced to misbehave. And they don't have sometimes any other option than misbehaving. Out of uh, nearly 95,000 kilometers of roads, 90% of roads are single, single lane or dual, dual carriageway, one lane per direction. And we did a study, and I have a few slides with the permission of Lakmal to show the lane marking and driver discipline. In some roads, nearly 80% of the road is marked with either single line or double line. Where either you have to follow a slow moving vehicle as a disciplined driver or show you a discipline and overtake at a single line or double line without, without consent law of the country. So there is engineering need. These are the identified reasons. I'll show you a few speeding, overtaking, drunk and driving, dialing and driving, driving under fatigue and other careless activities. I'll show you some results of some of the studies that we carried out of the year. What is dialing and driving? If you ask from a police officer, the main reason for road traffic accidents, they may say drunk and driving, which is wrong. Which is wrong. Drunk and driving has, con has controlled drastically by police. We should salute police for controlling the drunk and driving. They cannot drink and drive now. Drunk and driving percentage is low as only 18% after 9 p.m. That is also after 9, 9 p.m not during daytime. Daytime, you won't find more than 1-2%, to very low. Now you won't find that many accidents because of drunk and driving. But police do not keep proper recording. If they keep proper recording, they will find the number one source is using mobile phone while driving. Unfortunately, we don't have proper recording system. This was proven in worldwide studies. Because now we cannot live without a mobile phone. Not only the road, not on the, the where even the toilet, even in toilets, we hear sometimes some example. So we did a study about uh, use of mobile phones. These are some statistics. I don't want to read all this, but to show you how dangerous it is. It's peak in the morning, it's high in the morning, but less little less in, in the afternoon. It's a total overall. But what is important is how they use mobile phone. How many of you how many of they use hands-free and with the handheld? Some countries banned total use of mobile phones. Some countries still allow hand-free units, including Sri Lanka. 
According to the information I have, you can use a mobile phone if you have a hands-free unit. Or rather, the police will not find you fault if you use with a hands-free kit. But international research shows whether you use hands-free kit or not, your danger is the same. Because what's important is not losing your hand because of the handheld gadget, but losing the attention, depending on the message you receive from the other party. But still, because of this complicated world, they allowed it. In the same study, we checked another interesting thing. That was, where you keep your mobile phone? James, where do you keep your mobile phones when you drive? We found, in our study, nearly 70% of gents keep their mobile phone on their trousers, trouser pocket. When it rings, they try to take the mobile phone out while forgetting they are driving, and they press the accelerator accidentally, and meet the accident. Info, interestingly, ladies, we found most of the ladies try to put the matter, mobile phone in a small bag, and that small bag in the handbag, and have the handbag in the rear seat. At least they try to take the handbag out, and by the time they take the handbag out, your vehicle is out of the road. And uh, the danger, gender, gender variation, whether you like to accept it or not, females use more frequently than men. That is the, the statistics I found. It may be two or four other cities also. You may not like to accept it, ma'am. Yeah, let's do a study in Colombo, this is happening. But this, this is an internet-based study I carried out. Out of uh, the 20 odd questions, I asked at the end, should we allow mobile phone use while driving or not? 44% said, allow with the hands speaking. And 40% suggested ban completely. Because in this complicated world, you plan your work, assuming you have a sophisticated gadget called mobile phone in your pocket. So you cannot take the mobile phone totally out. What is important is to understand the danger of it. If you get a call, remember you are driving and you are trying to drive over someone else's life. So if it is a call, take it quickly and finish it off. And pull to the side and answer the call, but not long time calls. And then another study we carried out was related to this. The driver discipline and behavior. Usage of seatbelts. Seatbelts is proven as one of the safest units to reduce the threat of the danger, not to minimize accidents. There was another funny question asked from another politician to tell you the truth. When I made the presentation, he said, he referred one, uh, one politician's name and said, so and so was wearing the, the seatbelt, but still he committed an accident now. <laughs> he was telling me how that accident happened because he was wearing the seatbelt. I said, seatbelt will not stop for happening accident, but it will reduce the impact. So, uh, seatbelts and uh, child resistant shields are not common in this country. And this is the latest uh, seatbelt. <laughs> so, these are observation surveys we carried out to show you the uh, idea or the, uh, the feeling about the wearing seatbelt. Don't try to read these letters. The first one says rural, the second one says uh, suburban, the last one says urban. You can see when you uh, do surveys in urban areas, seatbelt usage is higher. That means they are not wearing the seatbelt to protect themselves, but to satisfy the police officers. Uh, when the seatbelt became compulsory, private bus drivers bought a special t-shirt. That t-shirt had a line like this across the body. So when they wear that seatbelt, from far, the police officers notice that they are wearing the seatbelt. So that is their attitude towards safety. And uh, again, between male and female, female drivers are much more careful in driving. Yeah, yeah, doctor. Professor Vedic Kari shaking. Very, 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 very fast compared to the previous one. They are very, uh, very safe. But I want to tell you one more statistic. The female driving percentage is much, much lower than male percentage driving in Sri Lanka yet. But still, those, uh, those few number of ladies are much more careful than men. And then, this is alarming. These were the vehicles we tested about the use of seat belts. The blue one says registration number with English letters. According to the Sri Lankan law, if your vehicle has an English number, the seat belt is compulsory. But it's not. It's not applicable for numbers with uh, digits, even if it is 302 dash. So you can see 
when the number is English plate, the, the, the seed plate usage is over till close to 90%. Whereas for number plates with uh, in numbers, numerous, less than 20. That means they're not wearing the seed plate to protect their life, but to satisfy the police officers or to abide by the law. And they were not wearing the seat belt properly, that is not another, another reason. And we checked a sample. We stopped some vehicles and tested uh, whether the seat belts are available and that they worn the seat belt properly or not. Out of the, num the vehicles we stopped, 76% were English numbers, and all the vehicles had the seat belt, 100% available, 100% functional, only only 70, 87% used, and out of the 87% used, only 86% used it correctly. What do you mean by correctly? Your seat belt should come from uh, through uh, through the shoulder, and it should not come through your stomach. It should come from your hip, right? It should not come through your neck. In an accident, if the seat belt is through your neck, that can cause serious uh, injury. So drivers were not aware about the adjustment in the side of the seat belt. So education is important. And this is for the other set of vehicles. Seat belt usage, we had only 24% of numerical numbers. 87 had seat belts, and out of 87, 92% were functional, but still they were not bearing the seat belt. So education is important. This is where the multi professionals has a role to play. The next one is about the wearing seat head helmets. Helmets. This helmet again, I'm sorry, the mouse is not working. You guys. Do you see something wrong there? Helmet is there, but not the chin strap. That is again to please the police. The purpose of wearing helmet is, is lost. We did, a, we did a study. These are my students who did that study. They stopped the bike, motor bicycles and uh, checked the suitability of helmets and the way of using this helmet. There were 3,251 motor bicycles studied. 3,184 male drivers and 64-67 female drivers, female drivers. And if I show you the, the statistics, this is how they distributed the helmet usage. Majority of full face helmet users were male, not female. So there were nearly 22% of full face helmets by male, and all the others are open face, and uh, the ladies, most of the ladies were wearing open face helmet. That is not what is alarming. This is the next, the usage percentage, whether it's clear rider or a normal rider. Nearly 98% of them were wearing a seat helmet. But I'll show you later. When the pillion rider become a child, the helmet wearing rate was less than 55%. So that means either the skull, if there's any medical uh, student or a medical professional will say, either the skull of a child should be much stronger than an adult, or the children, the parents are carrying someone else's child, child in the vehicle, or they are not really taking care of their children. I don't know which is correct for that because we do not check, we do not ask whose child it is. Uh, that will be another family problem if I ask that from father or mother. We do want to care, create that. And then, in addition to helmets, we ask these questions: What else you use as a safety gears? They use helmets fully, but not other devices. So, so this is to show you the attitude. This is how they wear helmet. If you use a helmet, helmet should be adequately tied to the face to take the real impact after an accident. The majority of drivers or riders keep a small space between helmet and the face to yeah, push their mobile phone in. Even police, police officers. They do not know how dangerous it is. And uh, the appropriateness. Only 25% of full face and 30.6 of, of open face and 17 point of total face were appropriate, proper, proper, proper Livia worn uh, helmets. So this shows even if 99% were wearing helmets, it's not properly to protect their life. So it says, if I leave most of the engineering projects out, the serious attitude problem. So there's serious problem with educational requirement. You can make roads, you can import new vehicles, but if you don't spend adequate money to educate and enforce properly, our efforts will not be useful. And the, the next study I carried out is about child restraints or how safe children are on roads. Can you see this? Uh, both mother and father wearing helmets, 
but not the child. Yeah. I know the indication is uh, according to the world records, one child is killed in road accidents every three minutes. So it is so serious. So it present of yeah, these are some studies we carried out about uh, the transport method and the level of safety of children. Let me show you the final result. 95% out of total children transported light vehicles and 85% total children on motorbikes, 70% three wheelers. And these were dangerously exposed. In light vehicles, over 78%, and in three wheelers, over 80%, and in motor bicycles, over 60% of children were transported unsafe. So I have a few more research, but uh, let me finish here because of the time restriction. We need to uh, act on this as a group of different professionals. It's not in hands with only one professional group. It's not only the responsibility of police to eradicate these accidents. It's you and me, you and I should be able to do much more than on road traffic accidents. When you drive, when you walk, when you get into a bus, and when you get down from a bus, and when you go as a passenger in a vehicle to educate your driver or your hired driver. I hope you will join that group and be a disciplined driver to eradicate this uh, motor traffic menace, accident menace, and I hope uh, the rate of accidents will not rise if all of us can understand what our responsibilities are. Thank you very much.